Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's panel discussion brought to you by the history group Trasna Natira. My name is Aideen Hassett, and I'm going to facilitate the discussion this evening. Our topic is a hot one. Our two speakers are going to talk about Sean Russell, Chief of Staff of the IRA during the late 30s and early 40s, his life and legacy. As you will probably have heard, our Taoiseach has mooted removing the statue erected in honour of Sean Russell from its position in Fairview Park, where it was first unveiled in 1951, with the likes of Brendan Bean in attendance. The Taoiseach has stated Sean Russell was a Nazi collaborator, and subsequently we have had a Fine Gael councillor, Ray McAdam, um, contact Dublin City Council to ask it to consider also the, the removal of the statue. So did Sean Russell's uh, associations with the Nazis in terms of furthering the Republican agenda of the IRA amounted to collaboration. Both Leo Varadkar and Ray McAdam did not respond to invitations to participate in the talk this evening. However, two historians did agree to talk to us. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to, to these two highly respected historians who hopefully will help us come to a conclusion one way or the other this evening. Um, so we have Brian Hanley and secondly, um, we have John Flannery. Now, gentlemen, before we kick off the discussion, I am going to ask Neve um, to play some clips from a BBC documentary called Dublin Collusion and the IRA, which was broadcast on March 20th, 2011. Um, Mike Thompson um, is the documentarian. Um, so we think these clips will have set a little bit of the scene. So if you could uh, do, roll it there, Neve, for us. <laughs> By 1940, news of the IRA's bombing campaign in England was making the papers in Nazi Germany. This action programme makes a fantastic impression. The bomb attacks carried out to date and the terrorist activities announced in the S-Plan show that the Irish Republicans are in earnest for all their fantasy. So, were the Germans content to just watch? Or did they spot an opportunity here? After all, Germany had helped Irish Republicans in 1916. And during the 1930s, six senior Nazi Party members had held important posts in Ireland. Though according to David O'Donoghue, historian and author of The Devil's Deal, a history of the IRA's relationships with Nazi Germany, the S-Plan was actually for Hitler's benefit. The S-Plan had little or nothing to do with forcing a British withdrawal from Northern Ireland, but it had everything to do with putting on a shop window display of the IRA's power for the Nazis. Because within weeks of the S-Plan being unleashed in English cities, German military intelligence, the Abwehr, decided to send an agent, Oscar Faust, to Dublin to meet the IRA leadership and have discussions with them. And that's exactly what happened. The payback then for the IRA was when and if Nazi Germany defeated England, that there would be nothing then to stop Ireland being reunited. <laughs> the IRA leadership at the time, I, I don't think they cared really how it happened, and they certainly hadn't taken the next logical step in the thought process, which was that it would be a united Ireland, but under the jackboot. It appears that not long after the first bombs had gone off in the UK, both IRA Chief of Staff Sean Russell and explosives expert Jim O'Donovan had gone to Germany to visit the Abwehr, or German military intelligence. It's clear that they wanted money, transmitters and weapons, but were they also buying into Nazi ideology? Russell was first and foremost an extreme Irish nationalist. Um, I don't think he cared for one minute how the country was reunited as long as it was reunited. But it's, it's now clear what the IRA wanted most from their collaboration with the Nazis, funding for the S-Plan. But it seems they were to be sorely disappointed. Zönke Neitzel is Professor of Modern History at the University of Mainz and Saarbrücken. Well, we have to have a look on the political situation just before the war. And Hitler wanted to invade Poland, this is quite clear, but he don't want to have a war against Britain and against France, and especially not against Britain. This was these Teutonic cousins from his perception. So he denied to do anything which would 
endanger the relationship between Germany and, and, and the UK. From Hitler's perspective, it was not very clever uh, to have uh, bomb plots uh, made by the IA before the war. After war broke out, the Nazis became more willing to help fund the S-Plan. But by then, starved of funds and success, it was coming to an end. In the end, the IRA got a little money and the odd radio transmitter. But what about the Germans? What did they get out of it all? We can make it very short. In the end, they get nothing. And they not even get any intelligence information from the IRA. So it was, in the end, a total failure. They thought that the Irish underground and the Irish government were, in the end, the same. And they didn't realise how complicated the situation in Ireland was. And they didn't realise that an anti-British attitude doesn't necessarily mean that they are pro-German or even pro-Nazi. Thanks, Neve. Um, it sounds like a great documentary. Um, OK, so first off, I'd like to, um, I'd like to go to you, John. I um, just want maybe if we could talk a little about um, Sean's uh, background, his family background, and maybe get him up to 1916, War of Independence. Sure. Um, if, if you like, let, let's try and rather than deal with an abstract figure, let's, let's try and put a bit of flesh on the bones and see exactly who we're, who we're talking about here. Um, Sean Russell was born on 13th of October 1893 at 41 Lower Buckingham Street, Dublin. His parents were James Russell and Mary Lestrange. Um, the parents' marriage took place on the 17th of February 1880 in Mullingar. Um, both grandfathers' occupation were given as farmer. Um, Thomas Russell, uh, Sean's father, died on the 18th of December. Sorry, and his. Uh, the grandfather, sorry, Thomas Russell died dating to December 1887. Now, the father's place of residence at the time of the marriage was given as Dublin, and the bride's place of residence was Dysart, County Westmeath. Um, his father died on the 27th of the 11th, 1922, age 70, and mother died on the 14th of the 4th, uh, 1934, age 76. Uh, Sibling, no, at, at the time, um, the family seemed to have moved around the, the North Strand area. The, the father was actually employed as a railway clerk. And from the addresses, it would seem that he was based at Amian Street Station and probably worked for the Great Northern Railroad. Um, first child to be born was born on the 12th of the 11th, 1880, um, nine months and a few weeks after the marriage. And um, that was Thomas quickly followed um, by Elizabeth, 19th of the 7th, 1882, Rosanna, 18th of the 4th, 1884. Now, um, the registry for entry for Rosanna has actually been cancelled because it was registered by William Lestrange, who was a brother-in-law of the father. And there's a comment on the, in the registry, not qualified. In other words, being an uncle of the child, William Lestrange wasn't qualified to um, register the birth. Uh, 16th of the 1st, 1886, another daughter, Mary, was born. And then the family seemed to have moved to 24 Oriel Street, a couple of doors away. And James was born on the 9th of the 11th, 1887. The next birth then is registered at 41 Lower Buckingham Street. And to 23rd of the, 4th, the 3rd, 1890, um, where the daughter Ellen is born. Um, Patrick was born 1st of the 1st, 1892, and this was followed by Sean, he was baptised as John. Um, William was born the 11th of the 11th, 1895, and Peter was born the 22nd of the 6th, 1902. So you see that for 20 years of her married life, um, Mary um, Lestrange, or Mary Russell, was actually bearing children. Um, if we look at the census return 1911, um, we see that James Russell is down as the head of the household. Um, religion is Roman Catholic. Uh, he's 59 years of age and he's employed as a railway clerk. And his county of origin is Westmeath, as is his wife. And the, the children are all born 
children living with them were all born in Dublin. And we see that Willem Lestrange, who was mentioned earlier, um, bachelor, is living in the house with them. And he's a delivery clerk. So th that's just a bit of background on the family. Um, we see that the rural origins, uh, the grandfathers would have lived through the famine times. Um, so like history was kind of omnipresent in the family really. Um, they, they would have seen what these hard times were like. Probably be carried with, with both parents, the tradition of what was happening around the time of the famine. Um, we, we don't know for sure, but were the grandfathers involved in, we'd say the, the Fenians, you know, um, but certainly th there was traditions there that would, would have influenced the children growing up. Um, we know that Sean Russell joined the volunteers in 1913 at its formation. And in 1916, he actually served in, in the Rising. Um, he was interned in Frongok and would have come under the influence of a lot of the leaders. Um, rapidly came into um, focus, I suppose, um, for his strength of convictions, I suppose, and his, his willingness to, to get involved. And he took the Republican side in the Civil War. Um, again, was attached to headquarters company during, so he would have served quite closely with Collins. Um, again, I suppose, working on allegiances that had been um, forged in Frongok. Um, but served quite closely with, with Collins as well there in headquarters company. And as such, he would have been at risk of constant arrest, probably always on the move, couldn't live at home, that kind of thing, um, changing, constantly changing address um, for fear of, would say, falling into British hands, um, sorry, um, free state hands during the, during the Civil War. <clears throat> um, no, he, he was captured and interned um, in the Cora. And during 1925, he was actually in prison in Mount Joy. So, he, I mean, he was of quite extreme, regard as being of quite extreme views and not safe to be let out at that stage. He was released um, towards the end of 1925, um, became involved with Dev and would say the, the remainder of the of opposition Féin at the time and went with Jerry Boland um, and Per Murray uh, to Russia as part of a delegation looking for assistance um, for the IRA at the time and were both looking for funding and for arms. Might hand back to you, Aideen, there at that stage. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, Brian, could you maybe um, then give us an idea? Sean um, went on then um, to become uh, Chief of Staff of the IRA in 1938. Can you give us an idea just of um, what was going on with the IRA um, in this period um, coming in, into the late 30s? Um, obviously, we've, we had Fianna Fáil, uh, De Valera had, had set up Fianna Fáil. What, what, was, what, was, what was it like? What, what was, the, what, what was the, the situation for the IRA in that period? What, was there a lot of support? What was going on? Well, I suppose, yeah, the important thing is that, that Russell, Sean Russell becomes chief of staff when the IRA are really in the doldrums and are politically uh, increasingly isolated. In 1926, De Valera and a lot of other people, including Frank Aiken, who'd been chief of staff of the IRA for a while, formed Fianna Fáil. Um, and the IRA at the time was a pretty significant organisation. Its chief of staff was a man called Moss Toomey from Cork. And over the next decade, the IRA numbered between 14, 15,000, maybe 20,000 men at various stages. It was very active politically, moved sharply to the left in the late 20s, uh, had friendly relations with the Soviet Union, but also with different anti-colonial, anti-imperialist forces. You've got people like Padre O'Donnell, George Gilmore, uh, and others involved within the Republican movement. And Sean Russell was quartermaster general at this period. So he was in charge of munitions, essentially. And what's interesting, because a lot of the documentation survives uh, in the Moss Toomey papers in UCD archives, and you can actually look at what the IRA was saying internally. And Sean Russell says very little, and he very rarely says anything about politics. And the IRA are always tearing themselves apart over how to relate to Fianna Fáil, 
whether to adopt left-wing politics, you know, how to deal with condemnation from the church and so on. And Russell very rarely says anything at all about politics. He always just wants to talk about arms, ammunition, how many men we have here, how many men we have there, how to get weapons and so on. He goes to the United States in 1932 and does a tour over there with the Clan the Gale, which is the Republican support organization in America. While he's there, he's trying to get Thompson guns, which had been left over since they'd been seized by the FBI in 1921. He's trying to get them back to Ireland. And he makes strikes up a big rapport with a man called Joseph McGarrity, who's the most senior Irish Republican figure in the US, who's very like Russell in that he's interested in armed force and very little else, and regards the IRA's interventions in politics as essentially play acting, thinks they shouldn't be involved in politics at all. They should be just involved in an armed campaign. Now, by 1936, the IRA are in big trouble. Fianna Fáil have won the majority of Republican constitutional support. A lot of IRA members have left the IRA, have become supporters of Fianna Fáil. Fianna Fáil are, are quite, you know, easily the most popular party in the free state. The IRA are increasingly at loggerheads with the government. So lots of their members are being jailed because they're involved in clashes with the blue shirts and so on. And in 1936, the IRA are banned by de Valera's government. And over the next two years, then you've got a succession. Moss Toomey is jailed and he's succeeded by um, Sean McBride briefly, who's succeeded by Tom Barry, legendary Cork or of independence leader, and then eventually by a man called Mick Fitzpatrick. In 1938, Sean Russell becomes leader. Now what's significant and what seems to be ignored in a lot of these discussions is that the majority then of the older IRA leadership leave in protest. They believe Russell has withheld money and weapons from the United States, that he's plotted against the leadership, that he's used subterfuge and so on in order to attain his position. They court-martial him, for example, and he's dismissed from the IRA. But he makes a comeback because he promises a campaign. He says, we've waited for far too long to do anything. We, we need a campaign. We need to strike at Britain. And he resurrects an idea uh, which had originally come around about 1921, by Rory O'Connor and others, um, and a man called James O'Donovan for a campaign in Britain. Now, the context of that campaign in 1921 would have been very different. The IRA was a much bigger organisation, had more support among the Irish in Britain. But it's resurrected and Jim O'Donovan comes back into the IRA, having not been a member since 1923. And he essentially resurrects this plan, which is of sabotage across Britain, bombings of power stations, train stations, railway lines, centres of communication, and so on. The idea being that this would raise the issue of Irish independence again, would force the British to come to terms with the IRA and leave the six counties. Now, that's pretty ambitious for an organisation which is now down to probably a thousand men, um, which is a very young membership, most IRA members by 1938 hadn't been involved in the 20s or the early 30s. They're, they're young men. Russell and O'Donovan and a couple of others are among the few who have that, that heritage. And it seems that by 1938, through the contacts in the United States, through Joseph McGarity in particular, Russell had already been approached by the Germans. Now, this is all clouded in all kinds of confusion. And, and it's very difficult to try and get a real grasp on what was being said. So what I tend to go by is what Russell said himself, what the IRA said themselves publicly and privately, and also what was said then in 1951 when the statue of Sean Russell was erected. And when that statue was erected, there was no embarrassment about the connection with Germany at all. The brochure that was produced for that occasion talks about his time in Berlin. He ends up in Berlin in 1940, which again is another story. We can come back to that. But the point is that certainly from... 1937, 1938, promises have been made that there would be funding from the United States. In the United States, German agents are involved with McGarity and so on. They're interested in the Irish issue as a way of obviously putting pressure on their potential enemy if there is to be a, a, a war. When Tom Barry leaves the IRA in 1938 and he leaves in protest, Tom Barry, for example, opposes the bombing campaign in Britain. He says it's immoral. He also argues that the money for this campaign is coming from the Nazi German American Bund, who were uh, an organization in the United States of Nazi supporters of, of German backgrounds. Now, I, as I say, a lot of this is, is clouded in confusion and obviously polemical arguments and so on. But the point is that certainly Russell and others offer action. They have promises of support from the United States, from Irish Republicans there. And they do seem, certainly Jim O'Donovan makes several trips to Germany and he's bringing back or getting radio transmitters and some money. So there does seem to be a connection at that stage with uh, Nazi Germany. 
So what other motivations would there, so, so getting money, getting arms, well, what, what other motivations would there have been for uh, Sean Russell um, and the IRA for approaching Germany? What, what was in it for them? Did they, would they, what, what did they think Germany could do for them? Well, I mean, I think one is the traditional Irish Republican idea uh, that it, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity and that if Wolf Tone could go to France and Roger Casement and so on could go to Germany in 1915, then what is the difference? You know, and if we could go to Russia in the 1920s, what's the difference with seeking aid in the late 30s? I think that's essentially what Russell thought. Now, you know, I personally don't think that's good enough. Um, yeah. Russell was 47 when he died. He'd been an active revolutionary since 1913. Um, so he isn't, even though he's not very interested in, in political arguments, he's not naive. And it was clear from the mid-1930s that Nazi Germany had a particular set of policies that most Irish Republicans should have found abhorrent, and which, in fact, in 1933 and 1934, the IRA were condemning. Because on Fublock, the IRA's paper condemned Hitler in 1933 and 1934 for his repression of socialists and communists, for the regime's anti-Semitism and so on. In April 1937, the town of Guernica and the Basque country was devastated by the German Condor Legion during the Spanish Civil War. It got big coverage in Ireland. Irish Republicans felt an affinity with the Basque people and so on. So Russell knows that these are the people he's dealing with, you know. Um, but at the same time, I don't think he's ideologically at all very concerned about the nature of the German regime. There are people in the IRA who are interested in it. And again, what I'm going by is what's published by the IRA. And by 1940, the IRA are publicly saying that if the Germans come to Ireland, they will come as friends and liberators of the Irish people. That the German government are smashing the British Empire in Europe, and that as part of, uh, uh, part of the outcome of that will be a free Ireland. That the Germans have no interest in territorial expansion or exploitation in Ireland. That they're our friends. Now, even in 1940, that's a pretty, I think, naive thing to put it mildly, to believe, given that Germany had by that stage, by the time that statement was published, conquered Denmark, the Netherlands, France, and so on. Um, and Sean Mulready, who was a, an IRA prisoner in the Curragh, remembered when news came through of the defeat of France. And he said some of his comrades ran around the camp cheering deliriously that France had fallen. And he said he couldn't understand. He says, why are we as Irish Republicans happy that another country is being occupied? But of course, those men thought that this meant Germany was going to win the war. And if Germany won the war, they would force Britain to give up Ireland. Now, I don't think in any way that's a given, um, whether Germany would have done that or not. But I certainly think a lot of Republicans thought that. Yeah. But others went further. And the IRA's publications in 1940, 1941 are not just pro-German but they echo Nazi propaganda in terms of complaints about the Jews as the new rulers of Ireland, claiming de Valera is under the control of the Jews. Um, you have praise for Hitler and Mussolini in establishing a Catholic government in Spain in, in, uh, after the civil war there and so on. So I think there was a strand of Republican politics that were, was influenced by fascism. And that's not surprising because the IRA throughout the thirties had been riven by these disputes about politics. And a large section of the IRA's left, who were anti-fascist, people like Pat O'Donnell, George Gilmore, and so on, had left the organization in 1934 to form the Republican Congress. Um, and in 1940, people like George Gilmore are saying to the IRA, what, what do you mean by these policies? Do you want the Germans to come here? Because that seems to be what you're saying. Um, and Gilmore is threatened by the IRA because he, he says that. Um, and other Republicans are uneasy about that type of rhetoric, true, but it's, it's certainly there in and 1940. Outside the IRA, obviously, as well, you know, um, at, uh, um, within, you know, Ono Duffy, obviously, and, um, we, you know, other mainstream. Uh, well, one of the, the, the strange things about this political turn is that in 1940, uh, a couple of IRA officers from Belfast, Charlie McGlade and Sean McCaughey, uh, visit Owen O'Duffy, the former blue shirt, shirt leader in Dublin, and ask him to become an intelligence officer for the IRA. Now, O'Duffy is astounded because he'd spent a good part of his political life fighting the IRA. But they believed that by 1940, he's pro-German and so are we. And you've got all these small organisations like the Irish Friends of Germany, Common Nashunta, little political parties being set up in Dublin and elsewhere. And there you've got Republicans mixing with ex-blue shirts and so on, because they do have a common interest now in Germany winning the war. And of course, for a lot of ordinary people, 
It's only 20 years removed since the War of Independence, 20 years since the Black and Tans were in Ireland. There is a kind of naive pro-German sentiment too, but there also is, and I would be, you know, draw a distinction between those who are ideologically pro-Nazi, who are pretty small in number, but who are there, and then lots of people who are kind of happy to see Britain look like it's going to lose, who are happy to see the British get a bloody nose and so on, which is understandable, but which yeah. is not the same as what, you know, the more committed people um, uh, want to happen at the time. Yeah, so basically it's, it's clear enough that Sean Russell doesn't fall into the, the ideological, uh, the, the, he, he wasn't a, a fascist as such. Yeah. He, I, I've never seen anything said by him where he makes any kind of, of, of allusion to anything like that, you know. Um, but he is in Berlin by the summer of 1940 as a guest of, of the Nazi government. I think, so I think again, you back a bit earlier that, uh, I mean, th there was tremendous naivety, I think, within the whole IRA. I mean, in 1932, um, Gilmore and Russell both met with de Valera following his election. And they actually met with de Valera kind of almost ready to suspend the, the IRA um, Army Council, um, expecting that de Valera going to remove the officer cadre in the Irish Army and hand it over to the IRA, that the IRA would basically become the, the, the army of the, of the day. And that they also expected that he was going to press on for the Republic, um, we'll say, and he, he, de Valera himself was kind of making mutterings about the uh, document number two, we'll say, which his, was his alternative to the treaty at the time. And the, when, the, when the meeting took place, they, they were full sure that kind of the whole thing was going to pick up from 1923, essentially, and the, the Republican was going to pull on, the, the North was going to, we'd say, become the focus, and the, the, whole, the whole Republican constitution was what was going to come into play. And there, when, when they realised that de Valera had no intention of pursuing any of this, they were totally gobsmacked and disillusioned, really. And kind of, that, that's a kind of a reflection of the, the kind of thinking that was there at the time. Um, uh, as Brian has said, I mean, you had these various strands. You had a fascist strand, you had a left strand. Christian, would say, well, even more Catholic than Christian, all running right through the, the IRA at that time. And kind of various, various groups were naively thinking that they're, their thoughts really were the thoughts of the, the organization at the time. Um, yeah. but it was, I mean, uh, Russell himself, he was totally obsessed with, with three things, um, procurement of arms, training of men, and readiness for a fight. And th that seemed to be the, his, whole, his whole occupation all this period. And he didn't seem to care in the least where anything that would assist in this objective came from. Yes. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, this was his more important motivation. Yeah, absolutely. So we've had examples, you know, obviously in the past of alliances, um, like the Second World War, the USA, Russia and the UK um, uh, coming together and there, there's no kind of concern about um, having to, to believe in each other's uh, political philosophies. Um, so, so what you know, obviously, in terms of Sean Russell, uh, what do you think of that? I mean, you know, if we look at it that way, you know, is Sean Russell really to be blamed um, for, for, for contact and the, for looking for support from the Germans? Well, Russell himself said that he was not pro-German and he was not a, a Nazi supporter. Um, Bauer Bell, who's probably the most authoritative um, source on the IRA at the time. I mean, he actually managed to get access to a lot of the, the survivors that were around when he started researching the IRA. And he actually described um, Russell um, as a simple and overwhelmingly honest man. Um, that that was the perception that came across. And it said that of Russell, he maintained personal friendships with men who abhorred his politics, but totally admired his character. I mean, yeah. they, um, Oh, 
McBride, it was McBride actually as chief of staff put um, Russell on trial um, for subversion of funds. And I mean, McBride was a trained barrister at the time. Um, he knew all the legalities, but Russell was totally naive. He, Russell kept no books, nothing. He just, and even though he was accused of misappropriation of funds, I mean, everyone that knew him knew the man literally hadn't a bean himself. That every, every penny he, he had or that came his way, to get her to um, the organisation, as we say, as he saw it, explosives, um, gearing up to the to this bombing campaign, which he thought would succeed in England. Um, the, he, he was actually found guilty, we say, and expelled from the, the membership. But straight away, there was a coterie of people, some senior figures in the organisation that actually gathered around him and that had more or less a total antipathy towards McBride. And they gathered around Russell and decided that they were going to hitch their wagon to Russell in this effort to, to bomb Britain. And um, Fitzpatrick, actually, one of these guys, went over to England and he almost succeeded in subverting the whole organisation in England and unknown to the Army Council in Dublin. Um, and it was only when an Army Convention was actually called um, ahead of the date that it was scheduled for um, that the whole plot, um, let's say, was rumbled. And the, 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 if you like, the, the, those behind the coup d'etat were suspended from the organisation and the organisation the heads of the organisation in Britain that had been removed were put back in place. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, Brian, can um, so John has mentioned about the 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 yes campaign. Can you can you give us a bit more uh, detail on that? Um, the how effective was it in Britain, or was it effective at all? Well, I mean, I suppose again, it, it's important to say that there was a debate about it. That you know. See, I think one of the reasons, uh, as I said, Moss Toomey was chief of staff for 10 years of the IRA, um, but he's far less well-known figure than Sean Russell. Mm -hmm. Sean McBride, Tom Barry and so on are, are famous in different ways, but I think people might be surprised that they'd actually held positions as chief of staff before Russell. And the question is, why then has Russell occupied this exalted position? Because he was chief of staff for about two years. He went to America in 1939, so he left Ireland. Um, he left a man called, called Stephen Hayes in, in charge of, of the IRA in his absence. Um, and yet he seems to be, there's a statue of Sean Russell, obviously, and there's all this discussion about the campaign. And that's because in part, in the Republican tradition, there's this kind of celebration of, of armed action, even if that action is absolutely counterproductive, because people within the IRA argue there's no prospect of success from a bombing campaign in Britain. This isn't 1921, it's 1938. Similarly, broadly, more broadly in the free state, the IRA didn't represent a mass movement. They represented a small, isolated group of people who didn't have one elected representative. You know, so Sean Russell isn't going to Germany representing Dáil Éireann as he would have done in 1921, for example, if he'd been sent on a mission. This isn't like De Valera in the United States in 1921, you know, on behalf of an, of an Irish Republican administration. Sean Russell is the leader of an organisation which is getting smaller all the time, which is demoralised, and he's promised action, and action is what he's delivering. But the plan for this S campaign is, is much more grandiose than the capabilities of the IRA. And to be fair to them, I mean, you've got a lot of very young people who go to Britain to take part in the campaign. They're arrested in large numbers in 1939, 1940, 41, and get very harsh sentences. You know, they serve very tough sentences in Britain during the war years. You've two men executed for the Coventry bomb in which five civilians are killed. Two other civilians are killed in bombs as well. The IRA, again, to be fair, tries to avoid civilian casualties. But once you begin a bombing campaign, it's very difficult to see how you're going to avoid them. And it does get a lot of publicity when it begins in early 1939. You know, it's big news across the world. But by the summer of 1939, the British police have clamped down heavily. It's harder to carry out attacks. In the 26 counties, De Valera is also clamping down. Joe McGarty seems to believe that De Valera would have tolerated the campaign as long as it didn't happen in the Free State. And of course, that is not the case because De Valera is very worried about a coming European war, about the Free State being dragged into it. And if the British thought that he was allowing the IRA to bomb Britain, then Irish neutrality 
would be in severe danger. So one of the factors, of course, in the repression of the IRA during the war years is that de Valera's government feel that IRA links with Germany are going to give an excuse to the British to intervene in, in, in Ireland. And, and this is a, 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 a factor as well. But I think that the, the idea itself was, was really not realistic at all that Russell was promising action to people who joined the IRA to fight and couldn't understand why they were never sent out to fight anybody. And it's true. I mean, if you look at records of IRA conventions in the mid-1930s, it's always next year we're going to do it. You know, uh, local units ask, when are we going to take the field? When are we going to you know, overthrow the Free State? Or when are we going to overthrow British rule in the North? And the Army Council always says, well, we're working towards that now. So another year of training and we'll do it. And it's really, you, you, you do have to ask what, they were attempting to do. And I think it was simply keeping an organization together in many ways. But that becomes more and more difficult as the years go on. And Russell does promise action. But I think you do, you know, at this uh, moment in time, it is, you know, uh, uh, realistic to ask, well, well, why should we celebrate this? Why should we commemorate it? Should we not actually look at, at was there another path for republicanism at the time? Could Russell have done something else? Is it not disastrous that he ended up in Berlin? Because whatever about Russell's personal motivations, he's in Berlin in the summer of 1940 as a guest of the Nazi government. Um, there's an account of this given at the unveiling of the, of the statue in, in 1951. And it's, it, you might be able to track it down online. It's from the United Irishman of September 1951. And I, I had it put up on a, on a blog, The Cedar Lounge Revolution, before. And that gives a big account of Russell's time in Germany. And... You read that and you read about he's been taken to camps to learn about sabotage and he's got the services of an Austrian officer who drives him around. He's got war maps. He meets, he meets Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister. He meets other senior uh, uh, military figures and so on. And they essentially agree that Russell and the IRA should play some role in Operation Sea Line. That when the Nazis eventually do attack Britain, there's a role for the IRA, presumably in sabotage in Britain and, and Northern Ireland. Now, that doesn't come to pass, but when you read it and then you realize that this statue is erected in 1941, when there's no excuse for knowing, for not knowing what the Nazis were like, and there's no hint at all that this is problematic, no hint at all that somebody might have said, well, should an organization that wants the freedom of this country be seeking aid from a regime which quite clearly is, is going to impose its rule across Europe? And really, do, you, do the IRA think that if the Nazis came to Ireland to help them defeat the British, that then they'd have packed up and gone home and said, okay, lads, there's your free Irish Republic. You know, yeah. that's the end of that. Yeah. I think, I think Brian is touched with, say, again, there and the naivety of the whole thing. I mean, um, Russell, Russell stated that he was looking for aid to, let's say, institute this campaign against Britain. Um, and that he was taking the aid on a no strings attached basis. Um, now, he, he didn't realize with, uh, the danger of, I, I think the danger of what he was actually proposing, because had he come to, would say, be any, anyway successful, and if de Valera had acquiesced and let him, let the IRA, would say, do their work at the time, I mean, he was creating a tremendous danger of Britain actually moving into Ireland. I mean, which was the very thing that he, he wouldn't have wanted. But I, I think that portrays the naivety of it. And also, th there's the fact there that, we'll say, as, again, as Brian has said, there was always this next year, next year. And this is what Clan Grail, who McGarrity was basically in control of in the US at this stage, um, were hearing all the time. Everything's gone out, everything's going to be done next year. And suddenly you have um, Russell, who's there and saying that, well, we'll do it now. I mean, let's institute this bombing campaign. Let's get cracking. And I think that's why Clan Grail brought actually into um, Russell so much. And he was very much the darling of Clan Grail um, for that, that he was promising this long look for action. And it also gave a focus for, let's say, the dwindling numbers within the IRA. Suddenly, the And I would say there was a plan there proposing action. So he, he did manage in that way to stop the, let's say, damaging of numbers that Brian referred to. And 
with the erection of the statue, that, the money actually for the erection of that statue in 51, that actually came from America. Um, the, the statue was erected, we'll say, under the auspices of national graves, but it was paid for with American money. And I, I think it was because he was such a darling of Planigwell in America that they stumped up the money for the statue. Um, uh, Brian, you were saying um, that he could have looked for another path. Sean could have, Sean Russell could have, why did he choose this path? What, what, what do you think his alternatives were at the time um, if he was going to progress the uh, Republican agenda? I mean, I suppose realistically, Russell was never going to choose um, the political path because that wasn't his, had ever, you know, he, he'd never um, shown any interest in that. But I mean, the, the IRA had debated in the early and mid 1930s about adopting radical social and economic policies and trying to challenge Fianna Fáil on that basis. And some members of the IRA did realise that De Valera's party were not only stealing the Republican ground from underneath their feet, but we're winning a broad constituency for social and economic policies as well. And ultimately, people like Sean McBride and, and the rest did form a party, Clan the Public, uh, which tried to challenge um, Fianna Fáil um, politically um, and had a little bit of success for a while in the, the late 40s, of course. Um, but I think that the, the idea that you could simply replicate the War of Independence again even by the late 1930s was, was um, unrealistic. For most people in the 26 counties, national independence had more or less been won. There were things that they were unhappy about, but you know, in 1938, Fianna Fáil get the, the treaty ports back. Um, people are unhappy about partition, but you know, nobody knows what's going to happen with that in the longer run either. It doesn't look likely that the IRA would have been able to overthrow the Northern state, let alone the free state. So I think that Russell's appeal is very much based on military action, and it's not surprising that there's a lot of IRA members who are attracted to that. Whether or not then he should hold this iconic place, because ultimately what happens in the 1940s is that the IRA enter into a collision course with the de Valera government. They're effectively smashed. There's internment, executions, and so on. Um, over a thousand men are jailed, some women as well. And the organization becomes even more isolated because it's fighting this shadow war against the Fianna Fáil government. But most people are happy that the Fianna Fáil government are keeping us neutral and out of the war um, and aren't very keen on, on the IRA's activities involving us in, in, in any way. So I think there is, you know, it's, it's a, a tragic story more than a story that should be celebrated. Um. John, um, was there any element of self-defense um, in, in uh, Sean Russell's uh, approach to Germany? You know, obviously there was a, um, a threat of the, the, the ports, uh, Churchill maybe taking the ports. Was there a certain amount of, of that? In, well, um, Churchill had looked for the, we'll say the ports to be made available um, to the British, we we'll say in, in the war effort. And this had been refused by de Valera. And, on foot at that, Churchill had made noises to be, would say basically saying that if we need those ports, um, because we are under threat, we will seize them and that's it. And I'd, I'd say a lot of the IRA thought that, well, if, they are, if Britain tries to come back in here, well, we're going to fight them. But I mean, it would have been what the, the, the members of the IRA and would say the the Irish army would have been annihilated within a matter of days. I mean, it would have been just a pure bloodbath. And I think, again, that portrays the naivety of um, Russell in thinking that this was an option um, that somehow or other they could prevent, would we'll say, Britain um, coming, coming into the country, um, if, if they so wished. And again, would we'll say his naivety is, would we'll say, there in the, in the fact that, would we'll say, if if Germany had actually attacked Britain and succeeded, I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't simply have stopped short there. They would have moved into Ireland. And at the very best, Russell and the IRA could have hoped for is that they would have been given the same role as, we say, Vichy France, um, that they would have been allowed to be German puppets within Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and if they choose to not accept that, they would probably have got a bullet or, we'd say, disposed, somebody disposed of somewhere or other. But, um, I mean, again, it shows the, the, the naivety that was on display, really, at the time. And I think that's it, what it was. 
pure naivety. I don't think it was a desire to collaborate with Germany as such, or support of of, of Germany, other than we'll say, my if your enemy is my enemy, well then let's work together. Um, but we'll say the idea that they were going to get away with no strings attached, um, that, that was a huge mistake, I think. Yeah. Um, in the clip at the start there, Brian, we uh, heard a German historian and uh, he was saying that the Nazis got nothing uh, from, they got nothing from um, Sean Russell, the IRA in the end. Would you, you know, how, what would you say in relation to that? Basically, collaborate. They didn't really have anything to give them, did they? Or they certainly didn't give them anything. Well, I think they got very little. They might have got some intelligence and some, you know, reports on British army movements and, and so on in, in Northern Ireland, because we're talking about, of course, an all-Ireland organisation and the IRA story in the North during the war years is, is slightly different, you know, um, and it, it bears kind of examination as well. But I think that, you know, what the IRA could offer the Germans would only have been relevant if there was an attack on Britain itself. And then they could have played some kind of a military role. Um, Such small again, numbers, though, as well. Well, I mean, uh, I, th I think it, whether or not they would have gained support if people thought there was a real chance of ousting the British, I don't know. In the military archives in, in Dublin, there's some intelligence assessments of the IRA, and it kind of shows you the, the diffuse nature of what people within it were thinking in the mid mid-war period where you know army intelligence reckon that you know firstly you've got ira members in the 1943 general election and some of them are going to vote for labor in kerry for example and dan spring local labor td would have been strongly republican others support the party called El Torini ashery which is a very uh, far right fascist party others um are are staying out of the election but if what the the military intelligence reckoned that if if we were invaded by the british the IRA would obviously fight alongside the state forces against Britain. If we were invaded by Germany, some would stay out of it and some would support the Germans. So again, you know, you've got this thankfully hypothetical situation because we don't actually have to, to, yeah. to live with the consequences. And one point that, that John made, and I think it's true, that right across Europe, you had a range of people who ended up collaborating. Now, some of them were pro-Nazi anyway. In every country, there were Nazi parties or fascist parties who were happy when the Germans arrived because it meant they were going to get a chance to, to be in power. And often the Germans were actually quite contemptuous of them, you know. But also you had people who were nationalists in the Ukraine or in Brittany and so on, who weren't necessarily fascists, but who thought this is our chance. The people who are oppressing us or the people we're fighting are getting defeated. So therefore, we've got a chance if we side with the Germans. And what tended to happen, of course, was that firstly, they ended up being used by the Nazis to do their dirty work. They ended up being given jobs as collaborators to round up their neighbours, to identify political opponents and so on. And then also they were usually abandoned by the Nazis when their usefulness had, had outlived itself. So the role for Russell's IRA would not have been a happy one had there been a German landing. Thankfully, that's, that, that is hypothetical. But again, I would urge people to look at what people are saying in 1951 about John Russell's time in Germany and look at what, you know, the lack of embarrassment, I suppose, or the lack of critical thinking about what the IRA's position at the time um, actually amounted to. Um, have we any evidence, John or Brian, that uh, Sean actually, you, you mentioned maybe they, the IRA did give um, intelligence. Have we any evidence that John Russell was involved in giving any intelligence or any help like that to the uh, Nazis? Is there any evidence whatsoever of that? Or we, we can only assume, is it? Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's the, the whole story, and John would know them as well, about the, the various attempts by German agents to operate in, in the Free State during the war years. And, and there's been a, quite a bit written about that because most of them got, were captured. Um, and some of them hooked up with the IRA and some of them didn't. Some of them were contemptuous of the IRA. Some of the stories are removed from the horrors of the time, almost comedy when you realize you know german spies asking Gardie for directions you know i mean so it, this is in many ways you know it, it's a bizarre sequence of events but of course the germans wanted to know what was going on the british the americans the germans the italians everybody else who had embassies here or consulates were all spying you know this is what 
every embassy has somebody who does that for them. So of course, they're all trying to figure out what's going on. And the British and the Americans are, are, are doing it as well, of course. And, and both the British and Americans consider intervention in the free state too in this period. But um, I think the IRA in general had very little to give them um, unless there, there had been a full scale invasion of, of, of Britain itself. Okay. Um, now, so we were talking there about um, Sean Russell's um, trip to um, Berlin in 1940. Now, um, I was really interested um, to, to see that Frank Ryan, um, Frank Ryan was with him um, on the on the U-boat when actually Sean Russell died. Um, and Frank Ryan, I always associated with um, the Spanish Civil War. Frank, see, Frank had been captured during the Civil War and actually jailed in Spain. And it was only when the war broke out that the, the Germans actually requested that he be sent to Germany. And he, he was sent to Germany um, pretty much as a prisoner. I mean, um, Frank Ryan's ideology would have been totally polar opposite to the, the German ideology at the time. Um, but he, he was sent to Germany, uh, we'll say, by the Spaniards. Um, and would say was allowed to meet up with um, Russell in, in Germany. And the two of them would say were returning to Ireland. Um, we don't know the exact circumstances of, we'll say, how, how, of what, what was planned when they, were to, when they reached Ireland. Um, but I mean, it never came to that. Uh, Russell was actually ill before he ever left Germany. He was ill getting aboard the submarine and his condition worsened during the voyage. Um, now, his brother has actually declared that he, all his life he suffered severely with his stomach. So it's, and he, because of that, he, he never actually drank alcohol. Um, but it seems that, let's we'll say at the time they were leaving Germany, he was actually suffering from, an, uh, we'll say, a severe ulcer and that, that also became perforated during the voyage and he, he died of septicemia um, and was buried at sea, buried somewhere 100 miles west of Galway at sea. Yeah, um, actually on that point, um, John, there is no headstone or anything because he was buried at sea. That's the case, isn't it? it is, um, I mean, it, is it, very much for the family and I suppose for a lot of his admirers, the, the memorial, which it would have been a substitute for a grave, really. Um, they, 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 I mean, there was no place of pilgrimage. There was nowhere that they could remember him here. Um, effectively, he was a man without a grave. And without, the, without that statue in the location where he lived and grew up, um, effectively, he was just absent from history. And I suppose that's why there is kind of a, a love affair, if you like, with the statue, that it's, it's seen as um, Russell's um, grave, really. Final resting place, yeah. Okay, yeah. um, we have a question on the chat. Um, did the phony war influence Russell as there appeared to be little European military action? And I wonder if full-scale war had broken out immediately, would he have gone to Germany? Additionally, why has Ryan's activity with Germany not tarnished his reputation? Uh, John, you, you've talked a bit there. Um, do you want to take that? Uh? Well, I don't mind if... Yeah. Go I ahead. mean, I would say that there is controversy about Ryan as well. Um, it'd be worth looking at Sean Cronin's book on Frank Ryan. It kind of gives an account of Russell and Ryan's last um, journey together. And also Fergal McGarry's book on Frank Ryan, which gives a more critical view. It is very difficult, again, to untangle exactly what was happening. But certainly some accounts say that Ryan um, had no choice but to go back to Germany others that he decided himself that he was going back. It's, it's quite unclear, um, but he, he was, he didn't have a choice when he was taken from, from jail in Spain. Very again, strangely, I mean, in the early 1930s, there were German students at Trinity in Dublin, there was a guy called um, Klisman and Hoven were the two men's names, who were involved in German nationalist organizations. There's actually photographs of them in, in on Fublacht at Bodenstown, and Ryan knew them. And then by 1940, they were military officers in German intelligence. So they personally knew Frank Ryan, and they're the ones who actually go and have him transferred from jail in Spain to Germany. So he actually did know people there, and they you know, thought that Ryan 
could be of some use to German military efforts too. But this whole, you know, um, um, scenario is, is, is very murky. Um, I think there is a lot of, of interest in Russell in part because of his, the fact that he's from North inner city Dublin, that he was active there in 1916, and then that he's active throughout the War of Independence as, uh, as director of munitions and so on. And there's quite then a, a degree of local pride. But there also, to me, then seems to be a great degree of ignorance about exactly what he was doing in the IRA over those years, what the IRA was doing, why is he in Berlin in 1940, the memorials erected in 1951, there's always controversy about it. Um, Clan and Gale certainly very much push for it. Um, and it does reflect, again, they want the IRA to go a certain direction in the 1950s. When the memorial is erected, people don't talk about Russell going to the Soviet Union at all. You know, uh, people talk about it now because they say, well, that proves that he'd have gone anywhere for arms. But in 1951, people aren't talking about that because, you know, communism is very unpopular in Ireland. Strangely enough, people are quite open about his, his, his time um, in Germany. So there's some people at the time who criticised the statue. In fact, um, Brian O'Higgins, who's a veteran Republican um, uh, writer, editor of the Wolf's Tone Annual, he felt a Celtic cross or a memorial like that would have been more appropriate. And he criticises the statue because he thinks that it, it, it doesn't make Russell look as courageous or as manly as he was in real life, because the original statue had Russell kind of given a clinch fist salute or and or waving, um, depending on how you how you um, interpret it, and that was vandalised in July 1953, and then it was replaced by a statue of Russell with his hands by his sides, and obviously the statue has been vandalised uh, since then uh, as well. But there was controversy about it even in the 1950s, and a lot of times it's, it's not that clear why there's controversy about it. Yeah, um, so. Just a little bit off topic, but um, Patrick Duffy, it is an interesting one. Could you talk a bit about the IRA in Northern Ireland during the period? Um, were any IRA suspects interned by Stormont or Westminster in the same way that De Valera interned IRA suspects? Take that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, internment was introduced in Northern Ireland as well during the war. Um, several thousand people were either jailed or interned. Um, you also had major clampdown, obviously, on, on, on the Republican movement, which was illegal anyway, and Easter commemorations and so on were, all, were illegal anyway. But during the war years, then, there's a number of clashes. Now, the IRA in the North throughout the 20s and 30s had in some ways been the poor relation because the IRA was mainly Southern-based and was very much focused on overthrowing the Free State rather than Northern Ireland. So during the war years, the Northern IRA becomes more important. And actually, I think around 1943, a guy called Hugh McAteer becomes Chief of Staff, who was one of the first Northerners to have that role. They do carry out attacks in the North. They do attempt at various stages to get a campaign going but it's very, very difficult and, and they're essentially uh, crushed by the storm and government as well. Interestingly, there's just one execution in Belfast of, of Tom Williams in 1942, whereas there's six executions uh, in the Free State um, during that period. But the IRA in the North becomes more important really as the IRA in the South are more and more isolated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, guys, we're actually, um, we're at nine o'clock, I, I can't believe it. Um, so look, we've had um, a really interesting discussion. Um, and I suppose what it all boils down to, I suppose where, where we were coming at today was, um, look, I want to ask you the big question. Um, Brian, I'm gonna start with you. Should the statue remain? Should the statue of Sean Russell uh, remain? in Fairview Bar Park, or should it be taken down? Um, I think the Republican movement has to have a discussion about what Russell represented and the politics of Republicanism in that era. They are not going to take the statue down because a Fine Gael councillor tells them to. And once it becomes part of this culture war between people who are, are, are Republican or anti-Republican and so on, the chance of any kind of reasonable discussion about it is gone. So I would say step back, um, keep the Sean Russell statue, but perhaps have a think about what Russell represented. Don't come out with the cliches. I mean, there's a statement from the National Graves Association, which essentially says Fine Gael had the blue shirts 
uh, Fine Gael had Oliver J. Flanagan, and therefore they're in no position to lecture us. Well, unfortunately, in 1940, the IRA asked Donald Duffy to join them. And in 1943, Oliver J. Flanagan made a notorious speech in Leinster House, which was actually defending the IRA. He was criticising de Valera's government for passing laws against the IRA who were patriots and allowing, as he put it, the Jews to run Ireland. So, you know, I think that we have to be careful in terms of the context. It's not just about England's difficulty being Ireland's opportunity. There was a political context that is, which should be considered. But I'm not in favour of simply taking down the statue on the basis that Russell is a Nazi collaborator, when in fact, of course, he didn't get a chance to collaborate. I mean, and, and the Free State wasn't actually at war with Nazi Germany. Whether we think that was right or wrong, the fact was we weren't in 1940. Yeah, thank you. And um, John, uh, the same question to you, should the statue of Sean Russell in Fairview Park uh, remain or should it be taken down? Again, I would say it should remain, um, even just for, for the simple reason that by being there, it does provoke controversy. I mean, if that statue wasn't there, this discussion tonight wouldn't be taking place. And by the very fact that it's there and that Russell is a controversial figure, um, it gives focus and this would say debate to the whole thing and here we are questioning history we're, we're investigating it which is the way we should be looking at history it shouldn't be just taken because what some that someone's granny taught them will say as history in a book that it's history but I mean let's talk about the people that effectively made the history let's see uh, um, if, if that statue wasn't there, we Russell not gave I mean, history. And from that reason, I would say, let's leave the statue there. Um, so I would say, what do you think? Or, I mean, I, I would say, yes, the statue should remain. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you both. Um, and, uh, Look, I hope we've we've um, given a bit of information this evening um, to about Sean Russell. I think we have, and uh, to look, we leave it up to everybody to make up their own minds. But thank you for giving your frank opinions, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.